Hello everyone. What I have here today is something of what, at least in my opinion, is a bit of a national treasure. Uh, this is Hopi. She is one half of our pair of what is probably the most endangered and rarest snake in the United States. Uh, there are a few other ones in all of North America, but in the actual continental and, yeah, in the, the continental U.S., because there's not really snakes in Alaska, um, the Louisiana pine snake the most endangered and the rarest snake in the United States. So, doing a little bit of a species spotlight on these ones, and we're gonna get right into it. So, um, these guys were for a long time considered part of just a subspecies of the other pine snakes, so the Pituophis melanoleucus, so like the northern pine snakes. And in the northern pine snakes, they have the three different species, the northerns, the southerns, and the blacks. And for a long time, these were considered the same thing until 1940, when they were given their own independent species status of Pituophis ruthveni. And about the same time, unfortunately, is when, uh, you know, industry really started to pick up in the United States and a lot of uh, deforestation and clear cutting started to really take place. And these guys' habitat really started to decrease. Um, the reason why the Louisiana pine snake is such a rare snake is because it has a very specific habitat. They only can live in the longleaf pine forests in several part in parts of Louisiana and Texas. That's it. They specifically feed on pocket gophers, almost exclusively feed on pocket gophers, and their habitat is based and built entirely around old growth long pine longleaf pine forests. And originally they were found in about nine parishes. So in Louisiana, instead of counties, they have parishes and about 14 counties in Texas. And then now by this point, they're found in less than four parishes in Louisiana. And they're unsure of how many counties in Texas. They know for sure two, and that's it. So the one of the big reasons why these guys have not been able to reestablish populations very well is because of habitat fragmentation. While now parts of different longleaf pine habitat have been, you know, protected and deemed that and this, so they're not really cutting them down anymore, but they're very fragmented. They're oh, one here, one there, one there, one there, and they are separated sometimes miles apart as well as by a lot of kind of, you know, metropolitan concrete jungle in between to make it so that way individuals have a hard time getting back and forth between their respective locations. But um, we're going to concentrate a little bit more about these guys other than just unfortunately their conservation status and we'll bring it back around. So like I said in 1940 they were given their own actual like full-on species recognition. They're their own individual species. These guys are really cool. They're a little bit different than all of the other pine snakes. So, Pituophis, that's the genus that also belong to all the pine snakes as well as the bull snakes and gopher snakes. What's really iconic about these guys is they have these really cool keeled scales. Oh, there we go. I don't know if you saw it on camera. There we go. We'll see if we can get her. There it is. Okay, cool. So, we're going to talk about that in just a second. So, they have these really cool keeled scales, kind of like a rattlesnake. They're really rough. They're not those soft little ones that like a lot of boas and pythons and even some corn snakes have to a degree. Um, the other thing is their iconic sound. So all of the Pituophis are fully capable of making this very loud, intimidating hiss that you got a little bit just now, although her head was kind of hiding behind my arm. They have a modified epiglottis. So whenever you see a snake open its mouth and when they're eating something or hissing at something and defensively, they have that kind of little tube in their mouth. That's not where their tongue comes out. Their tongue is actually below that. That's a little feeding tube that allows them to breathe while eating. But these guys have a slightly different shaped and sized one that allows them to make a very loud vocalization, essentially, although it's not really a vocalization because it doesn't come from vocal cords, but a very loud hissing sound that is used as a deterrent from predators. In addition to that, that little tail rattle that you saw me trying to get her to do, that's another defense mechanism. So when these guys are cornered, even though they spend about 60% of their lives underground and hiding, um, and I'll even talk a little bit about that in captivity in just a second. Um, whenever they are confronted by a predator or a threat and they are incapable of making escape down uh, out of harm's way, they will rattle their tail very quickly and violently to make in, like leaf litter and underbrush to make something of like a rattlesnake rattle, which is a deterrent for a lot of 
good reasons, as we all know, and then make that really iconic hiss, and then they'll raise up and puff up and S up and ah, ah, do. And so they will do that just like all of the other Pichuofa snakes. Um, these guys are really interesting because their growth rates and their reproductive rates are a little weird too. So these guys grow remarkably quickly. So the biggest thing about these is that when they're born, these guys have some of the largest eggs of any snake. They are huge snakes and they only lay very small clutches. I'm talking two to three, I think, I think the most that a single snake has ever laid is five. Um, uh, looking at my notes, I didn't actually write that down, unfortunately. But they lay very small clutches and they have very large eggs. So large that when a newborn is hatched, they can start eating small adult mice. Oh, you okay? Sorry about that. She's still, we're still working on handling. They're pretty, I guess you could say flighty and reactionary as you probably figured out already. Um, and so that's actually a reason why a lot of people have uh, found a way to determine whether or not that this Ruthven eye is mixed in with either Southern or maybe some of like the Kentucky locality where they're a little bit more yellow uh, Northern pine snakes is that their eggs aren't quite as big and they have large clutches because Louisiana pine snakes don't lay very many eggs. Um, but that's really cool. So that means that you have this giant baby that's come out ready to go. Like all pits, they have a really great feeding response. So you have this little baby that pops out eating adult mice that's gonna eat really well. So they're actually pretty easy to breed in captivity. They take, what's, what's interesting about these guys, so when I said their growth rate's a little bit weird, is they can grow upwards of two feet in their first year and a half. They don't always do it, but they can. They can grow remarkably quickly, but they do take a little time to mature fully to where they're really mature to produce these large eggs. So even though they can hit very long lengths, in a year and a half, two years, and she is two, by the way, um, they don't really fully mature until they're four, five, even sometimes six years old, where they have a decent, healthy, <laughs> healthy weight on them. So even though this girl is a decent sized looking snake, although, you know, when you compare it to like a bull snake who they can get upwards of six feet, these guys only get about uh, four, four and a half. The largest, I think, was about five foot four or five inches so not a big snake by any means but they're just a really cool interesting snake and if any of you guys have seen any of the other videos that i've done about bull snakes or pine snakes you know that i'm super into this entire genus and these guys are really cool um so with that being said being kept in captivity so as i made a big deal about at the beginning they're an endangered species they're protected conservation status that didn't happen until very recently they were still able to be traded across state lines and things like that until fairly recently when they were established as an endangered species and rightly so so what that means is that if any of the people who will currently have these in their collections and every single person who has a captive bred uh, uh louisiana pine snake both in zoos and aquariums or in the private hands of keepers all can essentially establish back from three individual places two private breeders and the Memphis Zoo, one of which actually worked for the Memphis Zoo. Um, this girl is actually a cross between one of uh, the Memphis Zoos and then one of the other breeders. Um, with that being said, so if you ever want to try to get into this species, which is really a really cool snake, and you live and you find a breeder who doesn't live in the same state as you, you have to acquire an interstate commerce permit from that breeder. Um, well, the breeder has to have one, then you have to acquire one from your de local Department of Wildlife to have them shipped legally to you. And black pine snakes are on there as well, as well as the eastern indigos, because they're all now an endangered or threatened species, and they are listed in under that. Um, with that being said, there's a lot of people that will make, you know, what sounds like a pretty good argument about, well, then why keep this endangered species? Why still have it? Why don't you release them all? And there's a couple reasons for that. So, number one... Whenever you talk about re-releasing a species, unless it's, we're talking about like an invisible arc type situation where there's none left, period. There's none in the wild. The only ones left are only in captivity and that we want to try to reintroduce. Then we start looking into private individuals keeping hands because when you have a zoo and aquarium or an AZA style facility, they adhere to much more stricter and rightfully so regulations and rules and procedures when it comes to any and all animals that they have, where they come from, where they're going, where, what they descended from, all of that. And even though these guys are pretty easy to track down and trace, 
because they have been in the hands of other private individuals, they don't really like to associate with that. But they've been in the hands of private individuals for several decades now at this point. So releasing them back in the wild isn't really, or giving them back to programs like the AZA and the Memphis Zoo um, isn't really a viable option. The other reason is that whenever you have animals kept in a private collection, most people don't only have Louisiana pine snakes. Most people don't have only snakes from Louisiana, Texas. They have ball pythons and carpet pythons and king snakes and milk snakes and all these other things that potentially have diseases and can carry things that could potentially decimate wild populations. It's similar to like the axolotls in uh, Mexico where they're a very endangered species, but there's thousands kept in captivity. We can't just re-release all the axolotls into Mexico because they could carry different diseases and fungusals and things like that that could decimate wild populations of both the actual axolotls and other species around them. So we can't just reintroduce them. But with that being said, there are some really cool people out there and programs that are doing amazing things with this species. For instance, just this last spring, the Memphis Zoo released 50 juvenile Louisiana pine snakes into different localities around Louisiana and Texas into their natural habitat to hopefully kind of reestablish their populations. So basically, what I'm just trying to say is that these guys are really, really cool. Um, oh, right. One more thing. So when it comes to keeping in captivity, so if you decided that you did, in fact, want to keep one of these things, their basic care is pretty much the same as what you would think a lot of like North American colubrids. You know, you would have them kept for the most part, usually on some drier substrate, um, you know, Aspen for being economic and traditional. There's plenty of bioactive or more natural naturalistic ones like Eco Earth and like uh, BioDude makes a really great substrate. You can make your own mix of topsoil and peat moss and things like that, which work really well. And that loose kind of dry substrate allows them to make their own burrows. They have this very large nostril scale on the front of their nose. Well, even though they will uh, most of the time pre uh, occupy already made burrows of pocket gophers and they'll go in, they'll eat the pocket gopher and then they'll reside in them and they'll move around to different ones um, searching for mates and other and other prey items but they will also kind of help enlarge them or move them around and dig under substrate and under leaf litter and debris and things like that so you have this large rostral scale that helps them do that so when you keep them in captivity you always want to give them a nice deep layer of substrate for them to make their little tunnels like you've probably seen like king snakes and corn snakes sometimes do that these guys are really good if you give them a big thick like two three inch layer of substrate they will form their own little tunnels in them and so you know you'll open up the thing and you'll like kind of hang out at one little hole of like one little entrance and sometimes they'll pop up out of that and other times they'll come pop up out of another hole because they have this whole like little prairie dog network system of little tunnels that they've made in their enclosures but Hope you enjoyed this video. If you have any questions about these guys or any other type of animal, um, let me know down in the comments. And so, uh, you know, I, I should probably reiterate this one more time that while I feel it's really cool to be working with such a rare and unique species, I'm fully aware of the fact that I don't think I'll ever and hopefully will never have to be part of like an invisible arc situation where there are none left in the wild. And the only people that have them are hands of keepers who have distinct lineage of them because this girl comes from a very distinct lineage and she has all the paperwork and all the background of where she comes from as well as her boyfriend who is not a happy camper, um, which is why I hope he's up here, uh, that we won't ever have to be part of a breeding program to reintroduce them. We just get to work with a really cool and unique species. Um, but hopefully you enjoyed this video. Hopefully you got something out of that. If you have any questions about these guys, about any other species of reptile, I'll do my best to help answer your questions. Um, if you can't check out our podcast, Keep Calm, it's just a snake podcast. We have a lot of cool people on there. Um, a lot of really interesting topics to be said. Um, if you know anybody that keeps really cool stuff or if you're interested in being a guest on the show, let me know down in the comments. DM me on Facebook, Instagram, all that social media stuff. If you're interested in merch, um, we have cool little stickers. What do you think, Hopi? You want to help show off? Cool little stickers and shirts and all these other really cool, fun things like that. Um, let me know down in the comments. You'll me email me at jayzsreptiles at gmail.com. Can't help but do a little bit of a, you know, shameless plug. So hopefully you enjoyed the video. Hopefully you're having a great day and we'll check you next time.